One year during Advent, a Sunday school class drew pictures of the Nativity listening to a CD of Silent Night and other Christmas carols. And one five-year-old brought his drawing up to the teacher and she was quite impressed. The baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph looked very nice, as did the animals and the angels and the three magi. And then she noticed a plump, bearded man standing beside the manger. Jimmy, the teacher said, Santa wasn't at the birth of Jesus. Well, that's not Santa, Jimmy replied. That's round John Virgin. <laughs> well, in, in fairness to that little tyke, I, I need to disclose it for the longest time. I thought round John Virgin was round young Virgin in reference to Mary's tummy. But I mention all this to get more than a chuckle. In our collective minds around this time of year, we begin to think of Mary in the final stage of her pregnancy. With just a few weeks left, she would certainly be round and showing by now. So it would be eight or so months ago when the spark of Christ began to grow in her. Today's reading tells it that spark was a powerful spark that way back then, early on, Eight months ago, both Elizabeth and her unborn son were deeply moved by that tiny embryo as it began to grow in the baby Jesus that we celebrate this time of year. And in the verses that follow today's reading, right after Elizabeth and John respond to the embryonic Christ, Mary sings aloud her amazing song that we call the Magnificat, which we'll be talking about next week when we lift up Mary and that beautiful song. A lot goes on in the nativity stories before Jesus is born, the months that happen. Interestingly, counting back from Christmas, nine months gets us to roughly around Easter season. So if December is when Jesus was born, it would be around Passover, now our Easter time, when Mary first learns that she's pregnant. And we can imagine that it is sometime around Pentecost, when Elizabeth and her unborn son and Mary are each deeply moved by the being that Mary has in her womb and the promise just that little Christ spark offers. Now, as far as I know, we don't have and never have had an early in the year conception of Christ or noticing Christ in the womb holiday. We just sort of put it off and celebrate it all at once, treating the pregnancy and the anticipation of Jesus' birth as if it lasted only a month, when really in our story the hope of Jesus' arrival was pending for months. And I'm bringing all of this stuff up, this timing stuff, because if you haven't heard by now, I love the Christmas season. I'm even stranger than most about it because I actually like to see Christmas things arrive early in the marketplace. In August, I've been known to intentionally go to craft stores and sneak a peek at Christmas sparkle in the aisles. And every year I begin to listen to snippets of Christmas music well before Thanksgiving. And the thought of Christmas the sights and smells and sounds delight me because they remind me that humans can treat one another so much better and do so with the compassion and care that comes with the hope of this season that we are now in. I love the sensory recall of these holidays when we collectively unfetter the spirit of love and it always comes galloping in and about just as it is doing this advent. This makes me very happy. I find it so very spiritual. And so I like the early signs of Christmas. I know that may go against the grain as an applauding of the commercialism of Christmas, but I cannot help it. I find much hope and promise in the harbingers of this season. Advent is a time of year when communities and families and strangers turn to one another with greetings and gifts and good words. Folks Focus on love, and the world is better for it. I'm convinced that the spirit of Christmas is a glimpse of what the world is supposed to be like all year long. Not the glitter and commercialism, but the kindness 
and love and discussions and longing for peace on earth, goodwill to all. There is so much hope this time of year on so many levels. We hope for peace. We hope for a new world. We hope for God's will. We hope for close family connections. We hope for care and compassion for not just family and not just friends, but even strangers and outcasts. We hope for peace on earth, goodwill to all, everybody. The hope the holidays offer in our collective religious and secular stories become reality this month as hope turns into action, care and compassion, love. The desire for the well-being of others becomes magnified and much more of an experiential reality for a month. For one twelfth of the year we start acting in a way that God calls us to act all year long in every aspect of our lives. And so in my opinion, the sooner people start turning toward the hopes of the season and focusing on care and compassion and desire for the well-being of others, the better. What would happen if we actually celebrated the hope and the promise of Christ's arrival for, from the calendar time of Jesus' conception until Christmas? Nine months of anticipation and focus on love. How much more would be given to the needy and the imprisoned? How many more visits and songs would be shared with shut-in elderly folks? How more, much more focused and important might family be nine months instead of one? How many wars and battles and conflicts and fights might be put off with grace extended in the anticipation of the Prince of Peace's arrival? And forgive the wordplay, but nine months of a pregnant pause for peace seems profitable to me. I know we're all probably wondering about now, would it be exhausting or exhilarating to be up for nine months like we were at Advent? And that's a fair question. And by the tenor of what I've said so far, you know I'd be betting on exhilarating. And even if it was exhausting, wouldn't it be worth it? Love pouring in and filling the voids as it does at Advent. The promise and the hope of peace unfolding. Why, it would be God's will being done on earth now. Nine times more now. Imagine that. I have no doubt it would be worth any extra work or hours or loss of street or sleep or even resources for that matter. And I'm not suggesting we buy more things or give more presents or even put up lights and trees for nine months. I'm suggesting we focus on God more and love more and long for peace more. I'm suggesting care and compassion and the desire for well-being be our mantra the majority time, if not all the time, which is actually Jesus' plan and God's call to us. I know I'm in the minority of those who get all smiley and giddy when the orange and black of Halloween starts mixing with the green and red of Christmas. I really do not care that love piggybacks in on the unpristine commercialism and the idea of peace hitchhikes in on it too. According to our Bible story, Jesus began in the womb of an unmarried and therefore criminal at the time mob. He arrived in an unpristine stable and spent his first months in the feeding trough of animals. So why not let his message come in on the unpristine commercial greed if it gets the job done? The point of the season, whenever it starts, of course, is not things, but rather the hope on wings that love and peace sings to our hearts and, and annually brings to our beingness. And here's the thing, all this love and peace stuff is counterculture the rest of the year. It's a radical departure from our usual way of doing things and our usual way of thinking. At Christmas time, it is okay to care about the needy and the sick and to do something about it. It's okay to want to help the poor and care for even those in jail and their families and do something about it. And by golly, it is even okay to say something cheerful to a stranger and to do it. And we even think about calling or writing our estranged family members at Christmas. At Christmas, we even 
dare to long for real peace. It's all a bit revolutionary. Well, the book we will be studying in adult form calls Subversive. Truly, a holiday season subverts, disrupts, and undermines our established system of doing things. Love is actually paramount. Commercialism is there for sure, but it is there all the rest of the year. In fact, one could argue 11 months of the year our culture's paramount focus is commercialism. It's just this one month that love, love, love is the trump card. Love one could think of as like the tortoise sneaking past the cocky rabbit of commercialism. And at the end of the year, love wins every year, again and again and again. And so actually Christmas is what's sneaking in, not commercialism. Christmas is what hitchhiking, hopping a ride, steadily winning the race in the usual way that we do stuff. We're also used to the Christmas stories that start hard to hear them as subversive. In both form, we'll be looking at this type of stuff in depth from now through the 12 days of Christmas. But we don't have to dig too deep to see some of the radicalness of this season. I just went on and on about how it makes love paramount, shakes us up each year to be a bit more like we're supposed to be the rest of the year. And this is not some modern, liberal, commie plot. The Christmas story began as a far more subversive text than it is today. It was, it was more subversive because the world was an even harsher place. Today, we almost take it for granted that the non-powerful have rights, that slavery is bad, that mistreating others because of the way God made them is awful. And that wasn't the case in first century Rome. A whole lot of folks were expendable to the powerful, and only a very, very few were powerful. It was a much crueler world in many respects. And you see, the Christmas story was initially intended as a challenge to the powerful, like Herod, Rome's appointed king of the Jews. It's no accident that the Magi honor Jesus, not Herod, or that Joseph and Mary, with God's help, outsmart Herod. Consequently, the real king of the Jews, the Christians, is not only born, but lives on to be the light of the world. In the Christmas story, God opposes Rome's appointed king and love wins. In the Christmas stories further challenge Caesar. Before Jesus, Rome's declared son of God, Caesar. Caesar was called Lord and Prince of Peace and Savior of the world. Those were names given to him. But in it, but it is Jesus, a peasant baby, not Caesar, whom God and the people in the stories declare as the real Son of God, the real Prince of Peace, the real Lord, the real Savior of the world. And we do so today. The Christmas stories and the Gospels hit God's nonviolent way to peace through Jesus against the violent way through Rome over and over and over again. And so you see, the Christmas stories were revolutionary in the truest sense of the word. The gospel writers and the early followers of Jesus were choosing and they were promoting God's way of doing things over and above earthly ways of doing things. It's remarkable that every single year we make the subversive choice of doing stuff more God's way than Rome's way. And there's so much hope in that. We celebrate, we lift up, we joyfully love the way of Jesus' revolution of love and compassion. We walk on the road toward peace on earth, goodwill to all. This time of year, we hold up the wonderful, the mystical, powerful nativity stories and we embrace them and the result is that love flows and peace on earth, goodwill to all becomes our collective expressed wish. And like I said, I want it to last more than a month, and I will take as much of it any way I can get it, even if it rides in early in stores and in commercials. At any rate, I am delighted to declare officially that Advent is here. Advent, the time of year when we can hear and taste and smell and touch and feel more of heaven actually breaking in 
And it all started with the conception of Christ by a teenage girl 2,000 years ago and came to fruition with the birth and life and death and resurrection of her child. And God's child. The one we Christians know as King of the Jews, Son of God, Lord, Prince of Peace, and Savior of the world. The one Mary and Joseph named Jesus. The one we named Christmas after and follow more closely in Advent. A very holy, holy, closer to God time of year. And let us hope the spirit of Christmas one day does indeed last all year. 